All right, John, you want to start? Um, yes. Um, sorry, one second. <clears throat> agenda item. Um, okay, yeah, I just want to briefly discuss this. Um, so we found recently that we have this metric, uh, East Geo request messages total, which is GRPC messages. So this differs from the request total or whatever the HTTP one is. Uh, in 1.17, this was broken. By broken, I mean we don't report it at all anymore. Um, it's a bit ambiguous what the feature status of this is. We have this metrics page, which, in my opinion, implies it's stable because it presents itself as, here are the metrics for Istio, and there's no mention that it's not stable. Um, but it doesn't actually explicitly say it, and the feature status page doesn't have it at all. Uh, internally, the folks that work on this treat it as experimental. There's like zero tests for it. Um, but I think that, unless I'm alone, that there's a mismatch in the public perception of its stability and kind of how we treat it internally. Um, we do know that some folks like Kiali are depending on this, for example. Um, so I wanted to get kind of a steps forward. In my opinion, what we should do is, as top priorities, fix the metrics so we uh, undo the regression. Uh, and then, you know, we need to actually add test coverage for this so we don't break things in the future. And I think we should also explicitly define the feature status so it's not ambiguous, which to me means marking it stable because I think that our telemetry API is actually one of our most important um, APIs. That's my thoughts. Um, let me know what anyone thinks. I strongly suspect, like Quat's not here, who kind of owns this area, I strongly suspect he would want volunteers for some of these, especially probably the adding test coverage. So if anyone is interested, this is probably a very good area uh, to contribute. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I mean, it's it's a very complicated uh, topic, I suspect, uh, both in terms of um, if it's really stable, if it doesn't have any tests, and if we should not fix the page to indicate that it's actually not stable, to be honest about it, instead of trying to adjust to reality. But the other thing is, uh, this feature has some impact. I, mean, I remember message getting the message requires a filter to get, you know, parts of the body. And la the only thing I remember is that it had some impact in performance. And given that we no longer do any kind of testing on performance, we are again uh, fixing it may or may not have some unmeasured impact on performance and and uh, it's unfortunate basically yeah <laughs> I, I mean my understanding for what it's worth is that there's actually two parts there's the east geo stats component and then there's a grpc stats filter and envoy and i believe that what we were doing before was in 1.17 was we were doing all the work but then not reporting it so it was actually the worst of both worlds. Now, there was that PR where sometimes we forgot to put in the filter, um, but that was only for some kind of edge cases. Um, so I, I generally share your concerns, but I'm not sure that it's actually much worse. I mean, my, my concern is not that if it's much worse or less worse, as we have no clue if it's how worse it is. It's true. Yeah. And uh, I would say that unless someone is doing some test and verifies that, getting this metric is you know reasonably cheap i mean let's say five percent ten percent decrease in performance uh then i would i mean that that will decide what part to go basically based on this data because we have the choice given that in 117 it was not there to say that sorry we don't support it if you want message metrics use hotel instrumentation directly i like i see your point but like to play devil's advocate well first of all in 1.17, when we broke this, it was to implement a major performance improvement. And so we kind of, uh, what's it called? Fungible performance <laughs> performance gain, performance loss, we're still net positive. Uh, the other thing, though, is that it just feels kind of like we're, <laughs> like I, it's like I could just say, OK, TCP metrics, I don't think anyone uses those. They have a performance cost. Like, let's rip those out. Like, we, just because it has a performance cost doesn't mean we can remove a feature that's been there for 10 releases and is used by 
by people, right? Well, but this feature has not been for. <laughs> it has. If it it's was completely untested, it was version 1.8 and used by Kiali. We don't have any tests for it, but that that lack of yeah. tests on Istio side doesn't mean that it's not a stable. Yeah, received as stable by. Yeah, I understand. No, I mean I, I see your point, and like I, I agree with. It. Sorry, sorry, kid. Uh, my 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 concern is again. Uh, we should get some data first, and the other concern I have actually, which is even bigger. We had a discussion with uh, with the GRPC folks, and and they are working on on uh, because GRPC is special. It's not like regular uh, TCP and HTTP. Usually, people who use GRPC they write code. They have usually their own uh, metrics. I mean, this GRPC defines some some standard metrics, and I, given what I know that they are working on and, and the direction of open telemetry, I suspect most people using GRPC will get this data natively from the client because they will have it in their application. So I don't know if long term it's even a good idea for Istio to have its own metric for GRPC. GRPC defines own standard metrics, which will probably be hotel shared with hotel. And users get confused by having GRPC report two different things and paying the price twice. That's that's really my my fundamental issue with with uh, and that's what you said in follow up to explore uh, hotel. Yes, I think exploring hotel metrics is important, but I don't think those mean that we remove the old ones. Like we, those are stable APIs, and we can evolve the stable APIs. But I don't know that means that we just rip rip the rug out from under users. I mean, hotel. I think it's uh, it's also the metric schemas are all experimental, and I'm not very convinced that they're actually appropriate for our use cases. Like, they don't have all the rich uh, peer metadata in them, right? So basically, they don't crash loop, uh, run out of memory, and have all problems we have. Basically, I mean, it's and they follow the recommendation from uh, from it. Sorry. Anyway, uh, kids. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, I want to I want to uh, touch on something that John just just mentioned. Uh, about metrics being an API. I mean, one way or another, like there are gonna be people relying on on those metrics. And yeah, even even when OTEL comes around, like that, those people aren't going to go away. Um, and you know, based on just looking at uh, the different feature status pages, the metrics page, um, there, there there's no mention of any of these metrics being experimental, um, none of them or any feature status whatsoever. Um, and to to John's point in the chat here, you know, if if you don't have any kind of feature stage in your documentation, the implication is going to be that those metrics are are stable uh, for better or worse, right? It's Hiram's law at work. So, and I, I I think that I'm I'm hesitant with any plan forward that leads to uh, the default set of metric changing. Um, the better, uh, I think, a, a good thing moving forward uh, as an action item would be to uh, actually document the metrics. Uh, I think it would be difficult to retroactively um, to, to retroactively to change the status of it, but maybe that's what the project has to do. Um, and it cost, I'm looking at the chat. I, I get your point as far as like if it doesn't have tests and doesn't work and it's not stable. I get that from a from kind of a, a project point of view, but from a, a, a contract perspective for a user, I, I, I mean, like, they, the, the expectation is still there. Um, and yeah, sometimes you're not going to be able to, to, to make everybody happy. You might have to make some tough calls for metrics that really need to go or really need to be turned off by default. Um, but I, know, I guess in the spirit of user experience, we should try to preserve, um, preserve the existing metrics as much as possible. Uh, I think Lynn was next. Yeah, uh, let me lower my hands. So yeah, I, I, I think I'm kind of agree with Keith on this. Um, basically, we are using these APIs uh, for metrics uh, in our product. So it's important to have um, maintain a similar contract. Um, and I agree with you, Kostin, like maybe the quality is not exactly stable, but from a consumer perspective who consume these API, exactly like Keith said, because we didn't have any warnings, people are really looking at this is a proper API for them to use and we didn't give anybody heads up, it's going to change. So people are expecting it's going to be relatively stable. 
Um, can I ask a clarification question? Is this brokerage on this particular metrics only for gRPC, but HTTP is okay? Yes, only gRPC. Okay, thank you. Michi, I think you are next. Yeah, so I guess I have a little bit of a larger question. When we say that we haven't stated any feature stage, is that for this particular metric or for our entire metrics API? As far as I can tell, it's for the entire metrics API. Okay, so we, we absolutely cannot communicate to our users that that has been experimental since the beginning of time. Yeah. Um, the, like this particular metric may not have a ton of dependencies or it might, I don't know. But generally speaking, the way that we format our metrics as we hand them off to Prometheus or other syncs uh, needs to be stable. We can't go about telling our users, well, you didn't read the fine print. Uh, this core thing is actually not stable. Well, it's actually, there's no fine print. You didn't read the lack of fine print. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You didn't read the actual code to realize that. <laughs> Yeah, we can't be blaming our users for that. We need to take responsibility for it and get it to stable as soon as possible. But the first step is to stop lying users and telling them, hey, everything is good when, when it is not. I mean, that's my concern. I mean, it's not about this metric in particular. It's that it's prevalent in the entire documentation where we have, you know, we pretend the feature is stable and we know very well it's not stable and it's it's broken and we have no way to indicate if we don't fix this you know we'll keep having this problem where, where where expectation is one thing and reality is another one i guess it depends on how quickly we can add tests at least at the beta level for compliance five years since we started this <laughs> the, the telemetry and it didn't happen so uh, so it's it's been in progress these five years or we just didn't get around to it because those are two different things everything has been in progress in the last five years <laughs> it's not good yeah, I think, I think there's a difference between um, telling users that, hey, the actual uh, kind of project testing and guarantees uh, for this project, for, for this feature, for this set of metrics is not, is a gap and that we're working on that gap versus saying, hey, there's this gap. We're not going to work on this gap. These things are now experimental. I think that's kind of what, what Mitch is saying from a project perspective. You know, a, a feature status or lack thereof is a contract. It's a, it's a guarantee to, to users and even vendors um, about you know how these things are going to be treated when it comes to the code base. Mm -hmm. And when we don't have you know the tests, the coverage, the general stability that we say that the project's going to have, then it's our responsibility to go back and, and put those things back in alignment as opposed to changing the contract. Yeah, okay. if we yes. communicate that we've got work to do here, I think that's great, and it's honest to the users. What we don't want to communicate is, hey, we intend to break this, and we have no commitment to not break it, because that's what experimental says, and that's terrifying. Uh, can I ask a question if we are honest today? Um, does anyone know any solution for the high, high cardinality problems that we have? I mean, is it we are just keeping the head in the sand and pretending it doesn't exist? Because that's that's really the fundamental problem with our metrics. It's 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 we don't have any plan, any solution, and any designs that will address this uh, today, as far as I know, with the current structure of the metrics. There is some uh, mitigation uh, method, for example, remove some attributes. Um, there is some configuration you can say I want to remove, let's say, you know, nine out of ten labels. But but that's pretty. I mean, if if we claim that whatever is documented in this page is a stable one, that means that the stable is the one that is crashing under load. I mean, I, I know we can disable labels, we can we can turn off the telemetry, we can. But we are we have the fundamental problem that the way it was designed with Prometheus metrics with super high cardinality that is unbound, it's simply you know not only against best practices or what Prometheus recommends, but it's known to crash and we don't have any fix for it, except disabling it, which kind of moves back to, if we if we tell high scale users to disable it, then how can we advertise it as production ready and tested and all good? I don't know. But uh, besides disabling telemetry, is there any solution to have the telemetry uh, in, in, in a good state that can be fixed or? Kostin, it sounds like you're talking about the cardinality problem. I'm yes. not clear on how that's related to our lack of testing. Can you help me understand the connection? 
that is not related to our lack of testing. It's related to us pretending that the current telemetry is a stable API that is supported. And yes, we don't have scale tests that show that Envoy is crashing. So if, if you have a lot of clients or if you have a lot of servers and, 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 and we can claim that it's stable by lack of testing. So if someone started to add tests for, okay, how does it scale if you have 10,000 uh, clients, then it will no longer work and we have no way to fix it. Okay, so it's more about scalability testing than compatibility or consistency testing. And the design of the feature that is, again, it doesn't have any solution that I know or anyone, I, I asked many times, and nobody so far provided any solution where we can have this design or this kind of metrics implemented with Prometheus and with the cardinality and, and the, the, the design it is. I just posted two links that on our official docs that talk about this. So I don't know that there's no solutions or that we're pretending that it's not a problem. So you're seeing those links show how to do it? Yep. If you prefer Carl's blog, which is, is good, there's also a link. Yeah, I was recording. He published a great blog on how to do this. Also, our performance tests are in much better shape today than they were three months ago. The Cisco team, as well as several other volunteers, have been uh, running them consistently on our 118 pre-releases. So that might give us a platform to add some of the tests that you're talking about, Costin. I'll read, but uh, what I've seen, uh, John, before is is most documentation that I've seen is basically reducing the cardinality by by removing the labels, like like Lee said, and basically doing aggregation and not exposing the, the what we document in that page. So I, I don't know a lot about our telemetry. What we're looking at here, this Istio request message is total. That's not a label, right? That's a metric. Is that correct? So we should be able to, at the very least, say our metrics are, are stable. You can expect the same metrics from one version to the next. What labels you get might be a commitment we can't make or that we need more testing before we can make, et cetera. But we can, it seems like we ought to be able to treat those as two separate uh, topics. I agree that they are separate, but also think that all the labels should be <laughs> stable as well. Well, stable with like the exception that in high performance environments, we instruct users to re reduce them, right? Sure, but just because we say that you should, that you can remove them and that maybe you should in some scenarios doesn't mean that we will remove them by default or break okay. them or whatnot, right? That's yeah. fair. Maybe the customer can selectively choose a few labels because if they use all of them, then it's a cardinality explosion. Okay. Um, so we can see we support this label, but you, there is a limit, right? Unless your memory is huge, you can store all of them in the Envoy memory. So probably best practice recommend you use less, you know, just a random ball, ball, ballpark number, let's say three to five labels or even two labels depends on your memory footprint or even with a lot with a single label it's a problem i mean if you have just one label peer identity and you have one million clients you still get one million that's times. correct yeah it depends on how many unique values in each label right if uh, yeah if there are a million then it's definitely a huge problem yeah uh, I mean, that's just, like you need labels to be useful. So that's that's not actually that, that, uh, that, that that's the whole idea, uh, John. Uh, with with uh, hotel, uh, well, they also have metrics defined without the label, so they are low cardinality metrics in the metric space, and usually they rely on access logs and other things to derive the data that we get through through to the normal label. So that's that's a pipeline that we discussed about. Uh, you know, generating access log through through open telemetry, and then having a post processor that is generating the data, uh, the fine grained data, and that is known to scale. It's uh, you know we 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 know how it, how it's used in in practice. 
but maybe that's a different discussion about when we switch to open telemetry if we if we start doing the access log based uh, label yeah, with, I, yeah i think that the state we are in with these geometrics is is fairly well known aside from the stability mismatch um it's not i don't think anyone thinks it's ideal um yeah I, I, I wonder... issues. we have a path forward in open telemetry we should design yeah. that to meet our future requirements lessons learned from the old way aligned with the standards blah 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 uh, I think Lay is working on a doc for that. Yeah, yes. I'm sure you would love to collaborate, Kostin. <laughs> yeah, yes, um, definitely. I, I want to follow up with what uh, Kostin mentioned, right? So for open telemetry, uh, me and Whitney are working on a design uh, of Istio adopting uh, open telemetry API. And uh, we checked with, uh, you know, Envoy folks, and we checked with uh, the uh, open telemetry folks. Actually, for metrics, now Mway doesn't have uh, AP, uh, open telemetry API. So potentially, we can use the access log based approach. Essentially, it's like this. So first, uh, we use the access log, uh, open telemetry access log, to um, output the access log. Then there is a separate entity, separate from Mway, to extract the uh, metrics from it. Then we solve two problems, right? One is the problem is uh, the lack of the Open uh, Mway open telemetry uh, open telemetry API for uh, metric. Another problem is this uh, you know card high cardinality problem, right? Because there there is a separate uh, you know backend uh, extracting the uh, metrics from uh, access logs. So that one I think uh, is probably some something we can you know adopt in Istio, yeah. How about uh, let's? I mean, I, I completely agree. We cannot change. I mean, people expect them, so let's let's leave them the way they are. Let's let's uh, pretend everything is okay for 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 this uh, purpose. But can for ambient at least, uh, and for the safest UD that we are discussing, take a look at what cardinality we have. You know, maybe reduce the number of default labels and and um, you know explore using access log or open telemetry uh, from start instead of kind of keeping it forever in, in this state since ambient and safe are kind of a break point anyway. How does Otel resolve this problem? So uh, Otel has uh, a protocol called uh, uh, open telemetry, OTLP, open telemetry uh, protocol. It's different from um, how the current uh, metric uh, implementation is. But fundamentally, even if you use uh, open telemetry uh, OTLP protocol, if you have high cardinality, then I suspect it probably will going to impact uh, OTLP too. But as an access log based uh, open telemetry solution is different because uh, it decouples the uh, metrics from access log essentially your overhead is on outputting the access log there is a separate entity extracting uh, the metrics from access log so it will uh, reduce the, uh, the cardinality problem but if you just use simply use otlp i suspect the problem probably will exist because you know you still need to maintain all these metrics with different uh, uh, cardinality with different unique values. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think Otel inherently solves the problems at all. Like, it doesn't matter how you get there. If you're sticking this data in Prometheus, you either put less data there or you have the same problems. Like, there may be a different path to get there. And maybe it's, it may, you maybe save like Envoy performance, but not Prometheus, right? The final metric store is going to be yeah, the same. Yeah, correct. That's the correct. benefit potentially is that we use it as an opportunity to reduce the amount of labels or the cardinality of those labels. Yep. But there's nothing inherent to the open telemetry protocol. Uh, now, they do define some uh, metrics. I'll post a link here. Uh, that, and they have eight labels on them um, as a default. Like, I think you're allowed to put whatever you want. They have a, a list of like a 1,000 attributes that you can pick from. Um, so if we used those eight, obviously we'd have much less cardinality, but they're also far less useful. Like, so we have to, you know, balance, uh, 
useful labels versus too many labels, how we want to do that. Um, you know, there's options too, like we can make it and opt in to more labels instead of opt out. Like there's a lot of things we can do. Um, and I think it warrants a very large design doc exploring this. Um, yeah, I think but it's, it's not like hotel is magic and somehow you know solves. Well, uh, there, there are two, two two things that are a bit magic, uh, John. Uh, one is using the access log for the for for uh, generating telemetry, and that's different. And second, the the problem I think Kit also mentioned or or maybe not. Uh, with hotel, you can reset. It's it's more friendly to reset. So you can every five minutes you can reset the memory. You just drop everything and send deltas. Uh, with Prometheus is not possible. So right now, is our problem is that we have one million clients. We need to keep one million uh, times ten uh, memory in hash mount. But why can't you do that in Prometheus? Because it doesn't support the reset. It's it's some subtle thing where you can reset all the metrics. So basically, it's, it's if you if you don't send a metric, it's assumed to be. Uh, so if you if you reset a metric to five, you have twenty requests from a user, and then one hour later you have another request. If you reset. Uh, I, 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 you will send the one and the metric. Will yeah, actually, I, I, I will try to answer John's question, right? Why it is different from Prometheus, right? So this uh, open telemetry based is a push based uh, approach. So it can push the delta, right? And the Prometheus instead is a pool based, right? So you have to maintain all this in your memory, then the Prometheus scrape it. Yeah, I'm aware, but usually the problems that we're talking about are in the actual metrics backend, Prometheus, not an Envoy, right? Uh, no, it's uh, so there is a subtle difference, right? For example, in your Amway, right? You you use the OTLP, you push no, no, the I, I know, but then you it, you you, you simply delete all of them, right? Because of the collector, you have pushed it to collector. You no longer need to maintain all this. But for the promises, essentially, you need to maintain all the combinations. No, of I, I understand things. that, but yeah. my issue is that the the performance issues aren't in the Envoy proxy itself. Typically, they're in the Prometheus backend. So how we get the metrics there is kind of irrelevant. Once they're there, they still use a ton of memory in Prometheus. But John, Envoy is crashing. I mean, it's not if you have too many, then we run out of memory or use too much memory. It's a problem in both places. Yeah, uh, only because we we don't implement. I I know for sure that we used to expire metrics in Mixer. I don't know the details of how. Like it sounds like the same as the reset, and we lost that when we went to V2. It's been an open issue. Yep, and it's not implemented only because no one has implemented it yet. So I don't think it's a fundamental problem. Our implementation is just not uh, no. robust. I mean, that, that's a problem. I, mean, I, I looked at this, and 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 uh, the problem is that Prometheus will not work well with resets. I mean, resets, yeah, it's a solution that would work, but it doesn't work with Prometheus to date. Hmm. Okay, I don't know. I mean, they did it in Mixer, but maybe Mixer was Mixer had its own protocol. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, Major. Yeah, I was going to say the original problem of the existing metrics. Should we just say is is beta just what we need to say here? Because that gives us room to say, look, there are performance caveats with the current implementation and beta that may change cause us to change something, but at least that's stable enough, right? Like, I don't. It doesn't sound like actually marking them is literally stable. The current ones makes a lot of sense because they may change. Hotel may change how we do this. We may change how we deal with metrics. Period. But just saying, oh, it's beta, which implies there's some support, and then backfilling the tests makes sense to me for that. And then, like the ne the next question of what does V2 or whatever look like? Does it use OTEL? Do we have do we do try to reduce the cardinality and performance problems? Like that's that's something you can do is follow up, right? Yeah, uh, that makes sense. Uh, I think it's up to East uh, community to upstream to define and upstream the uh, semantic convention for hotel. Essentially, the labels for service mesh in hotel, which is largely uh, missing there right now. Uh, you know, Jiang shared a link about uh, HTTP semantic convention. Essentially, the labels for used by HTTP. But for service mesh, the labels, the standardization for labels in service mesh in hotel, that's up to you know Istio, right? The Istio yeah. community define upstream, well, you know, then we can bigger, use that as the standard. That become industry standard. Yeah, that's I, a bigger problem and a secondary one to the yeah, this one right here at least. But yeah, I agree. Uh, that that's actually a big problem. And I have a concern about it as well. Uh, it's not up to Istio to define the standard. It's up to you know, larger ecosystem. We cannot define standards. That's that's a big problem we have with telemetry today. It's Istio only, and as I mentioned in the thread, gRPC also defines own telemetry, and for gRPC that 
we don't support. They emit their telemetry, we emit ours. We don't work with each other. Nobody can can use together uh, the two telemetries. And they are probably they have more legitimate claim to define telemetry for gRPC and uh, so same for HTTP. I mean, it's East of HTTP metrics, and everyone else has, else is using a different metric. So, so Costin, what I uh, I'm talking about is the match uh, the labels for service match, right? Yeah. So in in hotel side, right? East so is not the only East Q is match. not the only player, but uh, is the major player, right? <laughs> I understand that you probably there are other you know folks working on service match. They want to contribute to that, right? But if they are not, then you know East Q should contribute. Yeah. Shall we move to the next item, the Gateway API? Sounds good. John, I think that one's also yours. Yep, sorry. Uh, do you want to open up the, the issue? Thank you. Um, so this is something that me and Mitch have been discussing. Um, we didn't come up with any proper solution. So I wanted to just brainstorm, see if anyone else had some ideas. Um, so let me give some background. What we're talking about is the new Gateway API deployment controller, uh, which takes Kubernetes Gateway API and spits out deployments and services. Uh, it's used for ingress prior to 1.17. And in the future, will be ingresses or waypoints. Uh, they both kind of share the same, same patterns. Now, the issue was that before how it worked was we had a single EastUD instance, which was determined by leader election, would create a deployment. And that deployment was, was basically empty. Um, but then it was injected. So the injection logic would use the standard revision labeling um, and take the right revision and inject the kind of version specific image and whatever other fields were set by that revision. Um, so that worked fine. The issue is that now, um, we want to disable injection, and this is mostly for ambient, but it's also just better for ingress gateway because there's no need to have injection when we're already Istio that's creating the deployment. So kind of the new state as is today is that, again, we have the same leader election, so a single Istio D instance creates a fully hydrated deployment, so it has everything in the deployment as is. It's not injected. Um, what this means, though, is that the whoever is the leader sets all of the attributes for all the gateways. So there's like a global version based on who's the leader. Um, now, and one thing about leader election, by the way, for those that aren't familiar, Istio has this custom logic that the default revision will always win the leader election if there is one. Um, but that's still not the desired state that you know we have this single version across the entire cluster when we have revisions. Um, so we have, I mean, this was this was known, and we merged it early to get early feedback, but we didn't intend to ship this. We intended always to merge this fix, which I have linked to PR, which is to make it revision aware, um, which means that each ESTUD will only look at gateways that are part of its revision or tag. Um, now, the issue, though, is that if we use leader election in this mode, then only the revision that won that election uh, will handle their gateways. And so we'll have a bunch of other gateways that are just completely unhandled. And if we don't use leader election, then the 1.17 older Istios will still try and run their leader election. They'll win the election because no one else is competing in the election. And they will constantly try and reconcile to their old injection deployment. And so we'll see you know, just constant write, writes of the deployment from the old and the new uh, way. So the problem is, how, how do we resolve this? Right, We want the older ones to still be managed the old way, and the newer ones to be managed the, the new way. But we don't have a way to tell the old ones not to manage the new ones. Um, I want to pause, because I think that was probably a lot uh, for some questions. Um, but the, the TLDR is that we don't have necessarily a solution yet, but I have compiled a collection of things that we could potentially do that we could hopefully squeeze together with some glue and make a workable solution uh, that doesn't involve you know, users uninstalling everything and installing 1.18 and reinstalling things. John, maybe we should define the requirements first. I mean, what do we want to achieve? Yep. 
which is the revision was introduced for the purpose of having you know a safe upgrade so that means that the gateways should stay with the old version until you know the new one is considered to be stable so yes. any solution would keep you know if you have east your 1.17 and you install 118 there should be no change because 118 is not yet default Yep, and it just it's in testing. You should have ability to have some workloads use one eighteen by opting in as a canary. So it's uh, some opt-in isn't necessary. Yep, and the switch to one eighteen will happen when one eighteen becomes default because we have the default tag. Yes, I agree. That's the goal. What's broken with that today, Costin, is a little bit subtle. It's uh, if you install one eighteen, nothing happens. All of the gateways that are on the one seventeen revision continue using the one seventeen revision. But when you create a gateway using the 118 revision, uh, currently the two controllers, 117 and 118, will get in a battle over control of that. Yep. 117 wants to create a, a very vanilla deployment. 118 wants to create a very specific deployment. So we need some way to negotiate that relationship. And, and, and that's, that's, that's what I was suggesting, basically. So, so if the gateway has a class or a notation for, to indicate it's a canary, it will always pick the, the new one. And that's easy to detect because again, you you 118 knows it's not default. So basically one knows that it's a default. So if 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 ISTOD revision knows if it's default or not, then we have very deterministic behavior. Any gateway that has a label canary or gateway class ISTO canary will always pick the one that is not default, the newest, which we can determine. And when we change the tag to point to 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 one eighteen, then then it will automatically take over the rest. Does it make sense? I mean, is it as it stands today? One seventeen will still attempt to control that uh... because it doesn't know that it lost the tag. So if if they watch the tag, I, you you propose that uh, revision. In, I don't remember where we put it at the end, but if it's yeah. not an install option, but it's in a config map or or mesh config or wherever, I don't know where we put it. Yeah, the problem is unless we make code changes to 1.16 and 1.17, maybe even back to 1.15, um, then we they, they're not smart enough to to stop. Right? They are so that is one option. Because... I mean, we could do a, a backport of a fix that you know we tell users before you use 1.18 with gateways, update to the latest 1.17 patch release, and then you'll be you'll be future proofed. Um, but without that, there's not many options to tell the old one to stop working. The only two that I came up with is one, we can just win the election um, and we can rig the election too. So we can make it so that the old one never wins and it will never try. Or we could change all the gateway class names to something different. Um, yeah, that's what but that if, we do, that. if we that's do fun. that, then I think, well, we'd, I, I'd have to think about it a bit more, but we'd have to, um, like it actually impacts the XDS generation as well, so there may be problems there. I, I think flexible gateway classes it's it's desirable for other reasons. I mean, we have ability to indicate different classes. In I mean, we already have the waypoint class. We have other. Uh... So I mean, our gateway class is fixed today. If we change it, that is an API break to our gateway API implementation. Um, so I, I would. I would prefer to not break that. Um, backporting the changes actually seems pretty reasonable. We can tell yeah. people before upgrading to 118, you need the latest patch of 115, 16, or 17. Here's the list of latest patches. We can even do, we have that pre-upgrade check command, which can throw up all kinds of alarms if you've not properly upgraded. This also would break I, it's totally not supported so we don't really care about it but i can already imagine the tickets coming in saying my sto 1.8 to 1.18 upgrade broke um because uh because of this so um uh, we well this feature that. is fairly new it's not i don't know how far back it goes oh forget this is gateway yeah. controller so you don't have to worry too much about it um uh, yeah i think I, one nice thing is that um never mind i was thinking that even if we had it older like it broke because of the crds changing from alpha to beta um but i don't think that actually breaks because there's both versions so I, i'll have to see how far back it goes I, it's probably no further than 1.15 i i'd hope well and we don't officially support upgrades beyond 
uh, the two minor versions. So we can yeah. volunteer oh, right. further yeah. back. Uh, and just plus it was beta getting... only in 1.17. So we actually have absolutely no guarantees for 1.16 to 1.18 because it was alpha. So maybe we want to fix it because we're generous, but for sure. like we're talking about you know a new feature. It's not used heavily. There is some usage. We did a little bit of analysis. There's actually a bit more than I expected, but it's still like 0.1% of you know Istio gateway usage. So it's not like this is impact every single user of Istio. So yeah. did one seventeen did one seventeen have this ability to to uh, inject with, without injection to work without injection? No, it's new and master branch, one dot eighteen only. Can we use that to detect if it's injected? Leave it alone if it's not injected. That was one idea we had. We we can do that. The problem is then we never know when to update it from the non-injected form. So if you just have one gateway that you have you know had for a year and you plan to have for ten more years, it, it would never be upgraded from the injected mode, right? You effectively need to wait for that old control plane to go away. Yeah, um, which we could somehow try to detect, but then it gets pretty funky, especially once you consider like external HDDs and and whatnot. Yeah. So the the issue with all of the backporting, I, I love the idea. I think it's the cleanest way to get this done. Uh, on the flip side, we are pretty late in the game for 118 software development, and KubeCon is coming up, which means a lot of us aren't going to be getting a lot of code written over the coming three weeks. Um, is this something we ought to delay 118 for? Do we pull ambient support out of 118 and ship 118 without it? How do we how do we manage this with the schedule? Yeah, four eleven code freeze. Like, I can say I leave for Europe next week, so I won't be making a substantial contribution in this direction. Is there any reason we cannot delay one eighteen for a couple of weeks, a month? To because we have plenty of other things, and it's a big release. We need a lot of testing. It's you know probably the largest release we had in the last two or three years. 117 also had several regressions uh, from a. You know, we could say that we're spending the time um, ensuring quality of this release. Well, if we're extending the release, we're actually making it bigger, probably, right? <laughs> I assume everyone's not going to stop all the features they're working on and only go to reliability. I mean, we could cut the release branch on 4.11. That's true. That's, mm -hmm. that's true. We could do that. Just have an extended time. It does mean a little bit more merges, more backporting, a little bit more work for our release managers. Yeah. Well, one question, Mitch. Sorry to kind of disrupt this conversation. We can go back to it, but on on your PR, do you have the bandwidth to follow that through if someone else was to help with kind of the backporting idea? I uh, think so. I, I am still not able to run integ tests locally since leaving Google. Okay. Um, that's yes. Yeah, so, so one, I and hopefully others are happy to help with that. Everyone should be able to run integration tests. Also, don't buy a Mac next time. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think your PR is like a hard blocker for 1.18, or we revert the entire change, which I would love to not do. Uh, yeah, I'm going to try, it. I'm gonna try it on an AMD 64 uh, dev environment. I'm on the Mac M2, and I suspect that is the cause of my troubles. OK. Yeah, so let me know, Like, I think, you probably have the only blocker for 1.18. Like, there's a lot of things we want to do, but that one would cause a regression if we don't merge it for non-ambient use cases. Um, so that's pretty important. Um, yeah, it's important to me too. I mean, technically, I'm talking about something very similar at Istio Day uh, in Europe, so it'd be great to actually have the work done before I talk about it. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to say is, if we're backporting some fix to tell it to kind of stop listening, I wonder if we should also try and future-proof the current one. Um, so that next time in six releases, we're not <laughs> we're not saying the same thing. Maybe it's already handled by the fact that we're revision aware, but maybe we decide in six months that we hate revisions or whatever, and we want to do something else. Um, I don't know exactly. How to do that. I'll, I'll try and I don't even know exactly how we'll back what fix will back for it. But if whatever we decide is also something usable in the future, that would be awesome. I think. Certainly, we should be super cautious about any features that transcend revision boundaries. Um, th those, you know, whether whether we're talking about like the validation webhook or things like that, that tends to be where we get bit. Yeah, I will say, like on this one, we kind of knew what we were getting into, and then I think we accidentally didn't declare it as alpha and fix it <laughs> soon enough. I could have sworn I sent a doc bear that said this was this whole feature was alpha, but it is not there. So. No worries. 
So have we arrived at a decision? Do we want to postpone 118 release a bit and just cut the branch on 411, but postpone the cold freeze date by a couple of weeks? I see Mitch nodding his head. I can't read anyone else's impression. <laughs> I don't know if we want to right now say we're going to delay it, but we should maybe leave open the possibility. Like we know that 118 is one of the bigger releases that we've done in the past years. Yes. Um, we should make sure we don't <laughs> ship a bunch of regressions. Um, but it's, you know, if we're ahead of schedule and we make it on time, I don't see any reason to artificially delay it. So maybe what we say is that the the backporting to these other supported releases is a blocker for 118. Yeah, I don't think that part will be too hard. I can I can take on that and I have to think of what the solution is, but I'm guessing it's like add annotation if it's there, ignore it or something like that. So it shouldn't be terribly complicated. Yeah. Another option that again would be probably more honest uh, is to, you know, ship 118 on time or maybe slightly delayed but make it clear that 118 is a big release with a huge amount of changes including ambient that is alpha and a lot of other things and recommend users that they skip 118 for production and just deploy it for you know testing canary to provide feedback and to verify but do not put it in production because again given the amount of changes and our test coverage is probably not at the same level with the other upgrades we had i don't know how how much, if any, uh, regression or potential regression with ambient work cost the rest of Istio? So, in other words, if the users don't use ambient, would they be would they likely be um, uh, adversely affected? The idea is that all of ambient is protected behind a number of mm -hmm. flags that you have to enable. Um, so, in theory, they should not be impacted. The That's one change was kind of this one, which happen to impact other things as well. Um, although they're also kind of not the core stable Istio features as the newer gateway API. Uh, now in practice, is there some bugs that we ship? <laughs> Probably. Like, I, I want to say, you know, we changed a ton of code. I'm sure we broke something accidentally that hopefully we'll be fine before we release it. But in theory, it's all like protected. And we did a pretty, uh, as thorough as you can be for reviewing 10 or 20,000 lines of code review to make sure that all the new things are flag protected. Yeah, I mean, flag protection is, yes, it's there. We reviewed it as carefully. We have some testing. But let's be honest here. It's not, it's the biggest release probably in a long time. All previous releases were far smaller in terms of, you know, core feature change. I mean, <laughs> refactoring and other big uh, big changes. And, and uh, if we want to be safe and protect our users, it's probably better to just, you know, be honest, let them test 118 as an alpha release and um, focus on 119. We did it in the past. We had releases where kind of we focused only on stabilization, like I don't remember which one it was, but uh, 1008 and so forth, where we said this release, no new features. We just stabilized the previous one. And the previous one was kind of, you know, just features that people skipped it basically. I think another option is we increase the amount, uh, increase the uh, period of time for stabilization. So for example, right now, code freeze and release is only one week apart. We could um, we could make that, increase that to two or three weeks and do some more uh, targeted testing in the meantime. Yeah, unfortunately, that, that doesn't work very well. I mean, if we release 118 and you say it's alpha, people will put it on rapid on, on, on you know, test canary uh, clusters and make that they provide feedback. You know, there's, there's a, Stabilization period, we just have kind of the same kind of testing we typically do. It's not really, we don't get enough feedback and valuable enough feedback. Mm. I'd want to workshop the vocabulary there a little bit. I, I don't think I'd be comfortable calling it alpha, but generally communicating to our users that they should exercise more caution than normal with this release, I think is wise. Oh, definitely we have to. I mean, if we don't even say that, uh, you know, pretend it's a regular release and then it's, it's, <laughs> it's evil, but, um, I don't know how Linux calls, uh, you know, kind of. But regardless of vocabulary, I think do we agree that that 118 is a risky release, no matter what, and it's probably safer to have more testing, have more feedback, and actually get users to provide the feedback by. Uh... I I agree. It's it's more risky for sure. 
um, and we should do more testing. I don't know if I want to present that to a user when we should put that out. <laughs> we need to find the proper wording, but, but the, <laughs> yeah. the intention is for users to not put in one, 118 in production unless they know exactly what they are doing, but still test it on candidates because 119 will be based on it. And Yeah, I mean, I, hopefully any sophisticated customer that has a Canary is going to test any release in Canary before prod. Um, so maybe the expectation is we convey that there is a lot of changes in 1.18. I'm more worried about unsophisticated users who believe that each release is just uh, magically working and uh, they don't have canaries and don't have that stuff. That's what I'm trying to protect, not the advanced users. Yeah, the blind cube cuddle apply. With rolling a great in place and, and uh, yeah. Well, 18.1 really makes things much better. Just, I think the, the point is we want users to go try, but just don't throw it into production workload. Uh, yeah, I would I would avoid communicating that mainly because we already have so many users who are like, oh, I wait for the dot four release, and then they don't actually end up upgrading within our window. Uh, I don't want to encourage that behavior any more than it already exists today if we can help it. Yeah, we actually already have 1.18 alpha builds. Like, if people really want to be useful, they would actually be trying those now and giving feedback now before we ship it. That's that's much better than trying the 1.18.0 release. Now, granted, that puts a lot of burden on the users, but um, I think at least for like open source dependencies, it's a good steward thing to do. Like we test Kubernetes release candidates and betas, for example. It's much easier to fix things before we, we ship the final release. Are we settled on that one? So the agreement is to delay maybe a week or two for to get all the changes. Uh, I, think, I think the agreement is right now we keep to the schedule as it is, unless we cannot uh, absolutely have um, MVP features that we need to get in there, in no, which case we can do it. Yeah, I was going to okay. say the, the big problem I see is that the testing time frame, right? When we do the normal testing between free, um, between you know branch cut and code freeze, a lot of people mm -hmm. are going to be at KubeCon. So the amount of testing that will happen is going to also be limited, right? Besides just people putting in code. Yeah, with these blockers, I think it's likely we'll wind up delaying, but I don't mind not delaying proactively. There's a chance we'll we'll do stuff on time. I think John works even when he's sleeping, so maybe he'll be able to get it done. Last year, I literally got pull requests from John while he was on stage with Keith at KubeCon. It was impressive. I don't remember that. <laughs> there might have been some lag in the cellular communication. <laughs> I okay. God mode. I actually, I batch them up, so I, every hour they get distributed. <laughs> Okay, uh, any other topic in the last two minutes? All right, if not, I will all see you later. See you in five. Yeah, more, more like two. <laughs> later, guys.